good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I uh, truly hope everybody is uh, feeling healthy, both emotionally and otherwise, considering all that we're all adapting to in other ways right now. Um, it's awesome to see some familiar faces in the crowd and new faces. Um, and Tooney and the team, thank you guys so much for reaching out to us and including us uh, in this. It means a lot to us as, we, uh, as we're a growing company in Providence and beyond and being able to participate and sponsor on this level is fantastic, uh, especially in adaptive reuse where we have a pretty significant role. Uh, I just wanted to, I'll introduce Michael in a little bit, who is our, our featured speaker from BES. Um, I just want to give you a little background on building enclosure science, aka BES. Um, my name is Seth Izzy. I've been in projects in design and construction for plus or minus 20 years and about three and a half with BES specifically. Um, Michael Kenny is our main presenter uh, and he's been, uh, he's a building material scientist, uh, testing expert and construction consultant, sort of a national leader in building envelope, um, both in terms of systems and process for, I would say, 30 years having grown up in this uh, parents company doing that. And uh, also would like to mention Jeff Nickerson, who's all things project and technical development, uh, always doing great work. Um, so just quickly about um, us as a firm, we are a Providence-based building envelope consulting firm. Um, we focus on the function and durability of buildings and materials and systems, specifically relating to the building envelope. And some newcomers are often say, oh, what's that? We are, we're all about the outside of the building, the most challenging part of the building. Uh, to get right and maintain properly for new construction as well as existing buildings, um, uh, walls, fenestrations, roofs, system, uh, cladding systems, masonry, concrete, waterproofing, uh, everything about the where the building really meets its environment. Um, as consultants, it's, it's really all we do, which allows us to be specialists in the industry. Um, and we work very closely with AE firms, contractors, CMs, owners, institutions, municipalities, property managers, we're really sort of the technical side of it. Uh, we, we develop a lot of technical data uh, and help to develop optimal building solutions. Um, we, we have that, we play that role in many adaptive reuse projects throughout older infrastructure within New England uh, and beyond, which Michael will share with you guys shortly. Um, um, a quick note about our presentation and how it ties nicely into RISD's presentation. Just prior to COVID, COVID um, we were invited to RISD's Saving Superman class to present an overview of the Industrial Trust Building Envelope, aka Superman. Um, that sort of developed as collectively as a firm, BS is a great uh, deal of information on the building um, for our collective of consultants and staff who have worked here at various times throughout our careers. Uh, and we're very excited to put that into a presentation, some of which, uh, some of which you, uh, we have here for you. Um, uh, Avi, I think, mentioned questions, but if there are questions that do come up uh, throughout our presentation, feel free to use the chat box. If there's time afterwards, um, we can address anything you want or feel free to reach out to us anytime. Um, so with that, I would virtually hand over the microphone to Mr. Michael Kenny. How are you, Michael? Michael, did we lose Michael? I hope not. Nope, he just needs to unmute. Okay, Michael, are you muted? Yes, yeah, there I, you I go. was. All right. Does it not work as well that way? <laughs> Ten <Ten grade. laughs> Thank you, thank you team. Great support here. So agenda for today, we got through introductions. We'll talk a little bit about the building envelope, adaptive reuse. We have two example projects, City Hall, which is on the same square, Kennedy Plaza as uh, the Industrial Trust Superman building. Uh, we'll also present quickly as a case project, uh, Stonington Commons in Connecticut. If anyone's been to Stonington Borough, beautiful historic area, uh, old historic building that was adapted for reuse and uh, all the challenges that go along with that. And then we'll focus in on the Industrial Trust building, the history, the materials, construction type, uh, deficiencies out there, and sort of a little bit of why this big mess, like what happened in the beginning, what kind of building is it, what was done over the years, and where do you go from here? <clears throat> and um, uh, then potential questions and answers. I think that's, uh, we have that slated for the, for the very end. Um, next slide, please, Jeff. So when we're looking at the, um, the uh, excuse me, I'm viewing, viewing options, I wanna get 100%. 
so I can see the pictures on the side. Sorry, team. So the uh, areas of the building, when we're taking a look at what's going on on the outside that we really focus on is, well, how is the whole system performing? Is it, are there durable systems? What was the condition of those? Compatibility of materials, we look at the roof walls, glazing, so the windows, doors, all of that, foundation, waterproofing. And most people don't look at, think of the envelope as also including the slab and like in the basement and all that, but that's all part of the envelope. Even though it's touching uh, the ground, you have to look at how is it handling moisture. For example, in the Superman building, they were getting flooded out. They have two, two stories underground and from the very beginning of the building, they were getting flooded. And of course, the, the uh, hurricane 38, the whole city got flooded. Um, they, they really got uh, um, hammered. And they, they, uh, they have some innovative uh, techniques of uh, having their own storm system that were developed. I'll get into that later. Next. Um, oh, wait, before you go on, Jeff, interesting photo, if you can all see it on the right. And in, in the city hall building, which we'll will present as a, uh, a similar project to, so you know how you go about rehabbing a building. Um, we didn't have plans. A lot of the old buildings don't have plans. So we had to take it apart inside and out. And this is a photo that's a little inside and out. And that we took out a terracotta block from the inside from the attic where they have storage archives that are getting wiped out from water getting in the building. And so we could see so we're looking from uh, inside the, uh, the archives. We took out a terracotta block, uh, fun little snapshot. Next. So first, first building we'd like to look at, uh, City Hall. There was a question earlier on what's being done with that. Well, similar to the Industrial Trust Building, for many years, um, nothing was done. And then in the 70s, some work was performed on the building to um, fix it up a little bit. The city uh, oversaw that, a city architect uh, leading the charge. And, um, but over the years, uh, very little has been uh, done to maintain it, which I'll get into more after. 1778, uh, beautiful granite building, a combination of Westerly and New, and New Hampshire granite. The backup walls behind the granite uh, facing stone are uh, brick. So it's built very solidly. A lot of slate mansards, the dome, and then ornamental metals. And um, really, they've had such severe water leaks that they've had to abandon different um, offices in the top floor. Uh, so pretty severe deterioration of the exterior components and interior components. And some of their archives were getting wiped out. So they really needed to, um, no more spit and bubble gum uh, for the last 50 years, very little maintenance done on the building. Uh, not much budget put towards it. But now there's, they have a, a bond to rehab the full exterior. That's the windows, walls, roofs, and uh, the, the team leading the charge on that, Toronto Architects, with uh, the envelope work subbed out to uh, as in a, the team spirit, building closure science. Um, and uh, it's gone very well to date. We're partially through the design for the rehab. So you can see some of the, the intricate granite work. Most of the time this is done in limestone. If you have that level of detail, they put some real money into this building when they used all granite. Uh, it was assumed we talked to Masons early on that well, some of these pieces are gonna be limestone. It's just, it was easier to carve. You didn't find any of that on the building. So they really put some money into this and that shows you some level of detail right there. That's a pretty typical um, exterior view. So the mansards around the perimeter is where most of the water, water has been getting into the building. And you can see in this photo here that they have beautiful ornamental metals. Unfortunately, over the years, what happened is they had cast iron covered by copper, which are not compatible. Actually, it makes the, the copper corrode pretty rapidly as well as the, the cast. And over the years, some of that has blown off. Some of it in the cast been painted, which is not watertight, then it cracks and it rusts and water comes in. Some of it was covered in tin, which they don't really use anymore. That'd be more you know, 70s. And, um, and some of it lead coated copper. So now there's a real mix out there, but it's cracking is corroding. It's, it was beautiful. It's, it's no longer uh, 
beautiful and it needs some serious attention. Next. So right now this, uh, the granite is cracking and spalling like this, flaking, uh, which doesn't usually happen with granite. It means it's been near, uh, over a hundred years of water getting in around the perimeter, particularly around the roof edge and sitting there and not, not shedding water properly. We'll get into the waterproofing in a second. And after a while with enough freeze thaw cycles, the granite can come apart. And this isn't just one bad area of the building. This is pretty typical once you get off. You can't see it from street view, but once you get up a level or two, it's really getting pretty bad. So you can see at the perimeter of the building, this is up high, that would be sort of a dormer window that instead of, and it could have eventually had metal there, but there's no, a lot of metals were blown off this building and weren't put back. And they, but whatever was here originally in this location, it varies around the building what, what was done. You could see the granite stonework, they had mastic, that black stuff at the joints where that pigeon uh, uh, protection it is. And water is getting right into all those joints. Some of them have urethane sealants, caulking that, that have failed and water's getting in, some old mastic. And um, a lot of the gutters are clogged up uh, so that they're, they're not draining and all the water is just coming over the roof onto the granite and um, displacing some of it. There's a lot, of, a lot of large cracks. And this all has to be made watertight. But it can be made watertight. It just can't be a cheap caulking put on there. And then 30 years later, someone's saying, well, why didn't that work? Or why didn't it last forever? It just doesn't work that way. These buildings need frequent care, but more, even more than that, because that sounds like it's a never ending process of put, dumping a ton of money into it. It's really not, it's about doing it right. And none of this was done right, I can tell you through the years, as we'll see. This is where you had copper over cast iron at a gutter, and now the gutters aligned with a lead coated copper. That was a more modern, uh, I think that was done in the eighties from Apollo Roofing, very good firm. But Painting cast, as you can see, with rusting and cracking, doesn't work. So when, when, when expensive pieces blew off the building, corroded, failed, removing them and simply painting the metal underneath, that was just a base framing, really, um, it just doesn't work. And water's dumping in and, and wiping out. It, it, offices are very hard to live in underneath, although some of them are still in use, but the the plaster's coming off the walls, growing mold and so on. And eventually this cast will be unusable and, um, and the granite will be displaced. So you've got to save the building. So this all has to be covered. And originally you have a casting that eventually you get cast iron out of. You make a cast and you can, out of that, you can make a fiberglass replica. You can make cast iron. You can stamp copper, which is done all over the building. But those original casts, unfortunately, are gone. Look, everywhere for them through the city. Could not find the originals, not too surprising, but they try to save those so you don't have to recast everything. Now you'd have to recast, which is not a big problem. It can be done so it looks exactly like it is today. So that's the good news. And this is a, a view in the hip of the man side. If you can see the rusting piece of metal, that's uh, cast iron underneath the, the copper. Uh, and as it blows off, they, people have been removing those and just painting the metal underneath. Um, that area we used uh, to open up inside and out. When we took that photo, you could see from the inside attic outside that was removing a terracotta block, which is behind the, the slate tile. The, the, the frame is steel with terracotta at roof decks, floors, slabs, and the mansards, and um, within the steel framing. So if you look behind any of those slate, you see a, a terracotta block worked into um, light framing and no waterproofing. Originally it had waterproofing, but it's just wiped out, disintegrated. So that all has to be redone, which is new slate, which you can get the same slate, not a problem. Put waterproofing underneath, replace all the orna ornamental metals and seal up the granite. So very doable, but you do have to spend some initial money, do it right, and then every now and then maintain it. And that in this building has just never been done, which is not too unusual. People put up a, a big, beautiful building for the first 30, 40 years, you really don't have a problem. Just typical, because the pointing work, all the mortar and the, the granite and so forth, 30, 35, 40 years, doesn't really have a problem. But then you start seeing cracks develop, uh, mortar erode, uh, slate tile crack or blow off here and there. 
and someone needs to go around and stage the building and, and maintain it, or even see, hey, 30 years later, geez, in this original design, maybe we should have covered some of these granite dormers um, because it, there's no way that works as a waterproofing feature and they save the granite. So they extend the metal. Building right next door um, has this almost the same details and th they just extended the metal work over the edge of the dormers and it preserves the, the masonry below uh, beautifully. So even the original design had some flaws and but just tweaks to it uh, make all the difference. It, it's, it's hard though um, to have that done consistently with any large building that generally stands up well, it doesn't fall down, but it's to preserve it for the future it takes time, money, and expertise, and, and that's not always applied. Next. So when we, we're taking a look at the building, you work off um, boom lifts, aerial booms, a lot of people call these different names, cherry pickers and so forth. Uh, when it's gonna be redone, it'll be pipe scaffolding. Um, and we're working off lifts to take a look all around the building, which we're done with now. Only one major crack in the building, which will, it looks like there's a section of the foundation, which has um, sunk a bit, but we will study that and we're having the structural engineers look at that now, but nothing major other than have to stop the water from coming in if you want to save the building. Next. So another case study that's adaptive reuse, which is interesting, Stonington Commons, the history of this complex is they had, uh, thanks Jeff, they had a a, uh, the Trumbull building, the stone, uh, Ashlar Stone from Westerly, uh, built 1851 and munitions factory uh, supplying the Union Army. Interesting, Trumbull had a big part uh, that he played in protecting the area during the uh, uh, fight against the British, uh, 1814, somewhere around there. Then, and then um, they, they extended this um, complex to include the Atwood building, they call it now the Atwood building, the brick building, Atwood machi machine shop, it took over the munitions building, the stone one, and the, uh, and added on that brick building, beautiful right on the water, includes a yacht club, and so on. And during construction in 2003, there was a fire that it burnt down the, uh, the Atwood machine shop building, the red brick, and they replicated that virtually identically, which was, which was nice. And then they, cause this was being converted into luxury condos, a, a boutique hotel and um, a part of the yacht club was extended into the building, the, the red brick building and beautiful luxury condos overlooking the water. It's a gorgeous spot. If anyone hasn't been to Stonington Barley, they should walk around and look at the beaches and so forth and the little islands off it. So the problem is when you take a mill beautiful as it might be, or big mass masonry building, um, and you want to reuse it, you've got to really put some money into getting it right to make sure water doesn't, doesn't get right through the walls, um, doesn't crack and have pieces of, of stone or masonry falling off. And unfortunately, this building did. Um, during the fire, it did have problems with being converted to condos, failing, essentially, going through a large lawsuit. And um, uh, the fire had, we were experts on that case um, and including the design afterwards to fix it up correctly. So um, moving on, we'll look at some of the photos of that. We're working through next year. So you can see where the building was attached, um, some of the stone masonry and the brick. This section of the stone masonry was new because during the fire, so much of the stone was, um, it collapsed part of the building and was cracked. If you superheat stone, it will split into its veins. It has veins through it and they'll crack. And unfortunately during construction, they didn't, uh, re they didn't replace all the cracked stone, point real well and do a great job of waterproofing. It was done fairly well, but not, not well enough. Next. This is a photo of some of the guys actually uh, spraying on a clear waterproofing, which I'll touch on later. Uh, the controversial uh, uh, method of, uh, <laughs> of waterproofing a building but uh, they had a uh, restoration company out there attempting to seal some, some, uh, some leaks with, with a clear spray and waterproofing. It's just a shot of where the building comes together and, and you can see the balconies, the windows, the doors to the balconies, 
the parapets where the buildings join, a lot of places where water can get in, but mostly it was coming really right through the walls, the stone walls themselves, because they weren't um, repaired and maintained well. Next. Beautiful view. This is the stonework. This is an area that was the original stone. Uh, there's still, we identified many cracked stone that weren't originally replaced or could have cracked through the winter's freeze thaw cycles after the conversion to condos. But in any case, stonework had to be um, new stone, which is still available, replaced uh, at cracked stone. I don't know if you can see, well, I don't have a bullet, but you can see, I can see right in this photo, one cracked stone at the head of the almost a center window, um, left jam towards the, the lintel at the top. In any case, there's still a few cracks in there that have to be uh, fixed. But otherwise, mass masonry walls can keep out water reliably and uh, can be preserved for hundreds of years. So, Superman building. Very interesting building. I was uh, fortunate to know quite well. Oh, we can see C City Hall <laughs> in, the, uh, in the background over to the bottom right. And it's the City Hall building. So it dwarfs City Hall. Oh, this is a, it's a little unfair perspective to City Halls because it's, uh, you know, it's in the background. So there's not that much difference in size, but it's a big building. And, um, but very similar mass masonry walls. It's uh, uh, s similar in maintenance and uh, what you have to do with it. Just um, before I get too much into the building, I was just uh, a f kind of a fun fact from my um, standpoint is, you know, 1928, and um, similar to City Hall, Stonington Commons, other buildings, the first 30, 40 years, not much wrong with it, but um, except uh, that uh, lightning struck the, uh, the um, eagle's heads at the tops and blew those off. I'll get into that a little further. 1938, it got flooded from the, from the, uh, the hurricane, the big surge. But I was very fortunate to know, um, to grow up in New England, working with exterior restoration and getting to know the the old timers um, and uh, work on these buildings. So the real skilled craftsmen. And um, most of the work in this building was done from um, from Eastern restoration going way, way back. So this is generations. And the, the latest iteration of um, Eastern restoration, uh, name change, Eastern um, repair and weatherproofing was David Anderson, who I just was talking again to this morning to remember different aspects of this building for the history. But his father before him was working on this soon after construction. And, um, and then I got to know a lot of other people that touched the building in one way or another. So I've, I've had a, a and the, yeah, I know very well the uh, foreman who um, ran the project for most of the restoration through the years, so that they'd be 50s, 60s, 70s, and then work petered out. I'll, I'll get into that, but I'm just fortunate to have that background knowledge and, um, and those people still around today. I, you have to pull them out of retirement, which we do. So, so we know every piece of this building, what happened in the 50s, 60s, 70s, what, what was tried in the past, what worked, what didn't work. Um, but in any case, I'll, I'll, I don't wanna jump too far forward. Tallest building in, in Rhode Island, designed by Walker and Gillette of New York. It was very popular in, the, in that time period to put use Art Deco buildings similar, a lot of them in New York, there's Toronto, LA, all over the country, made of uh, a beautiful Indiana limestone and um, this very durable exterior component, in, in some ways even more so than granite, um, believe it or not. Very dimensionally stable, doesn't have the, this limestone, particularly Indiana limestone, doesn't have the same veins that tend to come apart and so forth. So, um, doesn't change much in size, the, the exterior pieces with changes in temperature or moisture content. Um, freeze thaw cycles really holds up well, which we'll get into further. But after Industrial, Dust, uh, <clears throat> Industrial Trust had the building put up and occupied it for many years, uh, it started to be leased out and the, the latest long-term VC was Bank of America, which took responsibility for the exterior uh, was in there for decades, but now it's been empty since uh, 2013. And um, I would say a fair assessment is they did not maintain it well, even though it wasn't at least language. Um, it's not cheap to, to fix this building up and get it right, but it uh, was not a good job. Next. So getting back to the construction, steel frame with concrete, terracotta block infill, which I'll show you a photo of. 
great product, Indiana Limestone, Deer Island Granite, and some brickwork, just a little bit of minor brickwork where to a building abutted it. Next. This is a photo for during construction. You can see that the steel frames going up, terracotta infill is put within the steel frame, and then limestone on the exterior, which most people look at the building, think it's all one color, especially since it's faded a little bit and dirt pickup and so forth, but actually it's two alternating colors blended in there. I, one, uh, one color limestone is a little more gray, a little, and the other is a little more tan. So and, and from a distance, it looks like all one color. If you look at up close shots, you see that they intentionally used uh, two colors alternating. So uh, beautiful building. However, over time, after the first 30, 40 years, um, you get some cracks that develop um, that need to be fixed, some erosion to mortar joints, uh, sealant around windows, uh, roof work, work on parapets, a lot of the, the building gets the most exposure, harsh exposure at corners and up high. That's wind, it's rain, so it's freeze thaw when everything gets wet. So up high and at corners is where um, it really needs a lot of maintenance and protection. Um, and if something starts going wrong over the years, say, geez, do we need to cap some of this? Like that the parapets that are made of limestone, should those really be capped with metal so water doesn't work its way into the um, building and into the walls and then start to displace some of the stone, which is what happened um, early on, especially by the 70s, some major work was done to, um, to rebuild limestone at, at, at a parapet on the south elevation and then up high at the, um, at the light, and, uh, which I'll get into a little further. So this gives you a good, there's a historical plaque of uh, Roger Williams and early story of, uh, and, and this goes right around the building, story of uh, Providence or Rhode Island. And you can see these look like they're brand new. Even though the north elevation gets, doesn't get that much sun, just a little glimpse that we have in this photo, but barely any, because the building's slightly offset. Uh, the, um, they look like they're brand new because no matter how much freeze saw you get, it doesn't really bother the limestone, this particular limestone much at all. So this detail is so clear. You get a little mold growth on the um, north elevation if you don't, if it gets damp for a long period of time. So really these parapets should be capped with metal with a drip edge so that water doesn't just keep running down. Now this is aesthetic. You can clean this right off with a detergent and light power washing, but really should be covered. And so you can see that repairs have been tried at areas that have cracked. This is a little sealant work. So that's kind of a quickie repair. We'll get through a few more repairs on exterior photos. You can see that the corners really take a beating. This would be a northeast corner. So that'd be worse. In New England, the storms in the winter, it's the northeast. That's where you see most of the damage. And the Bank of America, this is under their lease, instead of sort of replacing pieces, and as you can go to the, you know, go to the right from the corner, you can see really nice limestone, great condition. The corner, not so. There's spalling and little, you know, little pieces breaking off, some cracking, more bad mortar joints. And one, the cheapest way to temporarily secure that is little helical ties, little, you drill in little, little holes and you put in this spiral stainless steel tie, which you see some of those sticking out. And then one area, they just put up a piece of plywood and a few pins. And that's, this is a, a recent photo and this has been there for, I don't know, 10 years. Really not the way to handle it. But you can see that uh, damaged area and what was done. Next. And this is one of the worst areas, again, in the Northeast that, that gets um, hit hard. It's obvious to me that um, water is coming in around some of these windows. These windows replaced architectural aluminum windows, uh, I believe, early 80s, late 70s. Uh, I can't remember exactly, but they're extruded aluminum windows. The sealant would have failed a long time ago. Some water gets in. What happens is it gets down to the clips, metal clips that hold the limestone back to the frame. And if they rust enough, they'll pop a little piece of limestone. It doesn't mean that this limestone itself is going anywhere, but you don't want to get hit by one of those. So they do have nets up right now. Um, but there's not really a lot of this. If you go through the whole building, it's the one, two percent of the building that you know, have a crack or a spall like this. So this looks horrible. That's what people say, like, geez, what are we going to do about this? Well, you you replace a piece of the limestone, it's readily available. You put in a stainless steel pen. Um, 
and then this is either at cracks or spalls, and then make sure your joints are, are weather tight and you're fine. This is an area where they temporarily did at least stainless steel parts that wouldn't, that wouldn't rust, but just temporarily securing a lintel that had cracked. That was work was done on the Bank of America at a uh, area where it was a little bit displaced and they were worried about it. They put in a pen. Now up high where you have a lot of weather, you can see where that rusted rail is. There's no metal going over, no, no way of that there's, they're, they're protecting that stone up high. It gets hit with high winds, a lot of rain, freeze thaw cycles. And limestone doesn't make a great roof. And in a sense, the, that mass masonry structure you're looking at it forms essentially a roof as it keeps stepping back. So to save this, you'd really want to look at, at uh, well, first of all, rebuilding the worst sections as been, has been done successfully in the past, but then covering it so that that never happens again. Flat roofs, this is showing you what's up top. A lot of abandoned mechanicals shows you how there's a brick back up at the roof, how the wall construction is and the pieces of limestone integrated. Usually the water comes in that, that harms the exterior walls at the interfaces so you see where the roof ties into the wall, the rails and so forth. So you've got to get those right. Modern building would have all that covered with metal. It's what we would suggest for the building. So that just goes away. It really would not change the look of the building and has already been done in spots, but just the top edge should be, should shed water correctly. So this would be a common technique, cheaper uh, technique of properly repairing it compared to properly repairing a building. Look at the photo on the right. That's a mortar patch uh, with caulking, urethane sealant installed. And the patch, typically within five or 10 years, it'll, it'll look like this. It'll start spalling again um, because usually there's some rusting there that hasn't, you haven't, re, you haven't changed out a rusting pin in this instance. So it'll just keep rusting and popping out that piece. Uh, the patch doesn't bond really well uh, typically and tends to, to crack with the interface. And then urethane sealant, 10, 20 years, it'll fall apart. But no one's going back to look at this and caring about it 10, 20 years later, typically. And the photo on the left is a displaced lentil at the head of a window. So they've got, you know, they've got a few of these, but caulking it, caulking the crack in the joint above with urethane sealant do just doesn't do the trick. You really, they should have replaced that piece. It costs a little more money, but it, it saves the building. So that's, and that's very typical for this building. If you look at a trouble spot, it can be done on a spot by spot basis. And we don't, as consultants, as long as it's done well, it, it's not a viewpoint of being a preservationist. It's just, because we always have to go through options of, should it be stripped completely? Should it be cloud over, which you can do? Should it be pinned? Should it, you know, what are the different options? And we look at every option, but it, it's, we wanna be involved with something that works, that two years later, five years later, 10 years later, or the next generation even has something that isn't a constant headache. So it would have been a waste of money, no matter what you did, to, to put in something that's gonna rapidly fail. Um, so we don't have any skin in the game on terms of which direction the building takes, but it should be done right no matter what it is so that you're not back in the same boat five or 10 years later. And doing that right, tried and true, you replace that piece of limestone that's cracked, put in stainless steel pins, and you don't have to worry about that piece again. Not in my lifetime anyway. Another, this, this was even taking some of the original limestone, just caulking, mortaring in a spalled area. And then on the right, another area that's an incipient, called an incipient spall. It's about to, it's about to come off. Uh, and some of that, some of the old urethane sealant, which has a life of, of 20 years at best. Uh, you can, there's a very controversial topic of whether or not you ever seal joints in masonry, mass masonry. Um, the, historically, it's been kind of a bad idea in that the sealants don't last a long time if you use urethane sealants. Uh, and People don't go back up on the building typically to maintain it. Um, that was a stopgap measure where a lot of water was getting in and as the sealant fails or, or more water gets in from above for whatever reason, say you didn't fix the roof edge or something and it's just gonna fail again. So it's not well thought of in the industry generally. However, 
modern technology innovation, there are products that seal up joints well. Additives in the mortar that make them more water repellent. Uh, preservationists, now you get cringe a little when we say something like that, but it exists. It's true. Modern technology can be a hybrid. You can use silicone sealants in spots that are textured that will last well beyond my lifetime. Um, long, long term uh, products that don't get bothered by UV, that are textured and look like mortar, that really seal up joints well and actually are the uh, material of choice. If you were putting up a building and it was a veneer of large granite, limestone, whatever, particularly granite, let's say, many buildings, Providence, they all have silicone sealing joints at the perimeters. And if you go back, and I have 20, 30 years later, they're almost all completely intact. And they breathe. They're high, very hydrophobic. They move very freely. They bond really well, as long as you pick the right material and do your testing. And they seal up water so that you don't have corrosion in the steel and then the fasteners and all that. That said, I don't own a company that supplies silicone. I don't get paid any extra. <laughs> and I don't have an opinion as to what direction people should take. Although sometimes people say, hey, so if you're building, what would you do? Mm, this in spots, I would probably put in a textured silicone, but you'd also need to, um, one key point is access to the building, a modern building will have the ability to drop over a swing scaffolding very quickly. So attachment points, which this building does, does not currently have what you would need today. So you could quickly mount your already pre-existing swing scaffolding on the side of the building, lower it, and every so many years, take a peek and fix up spots so that that one, two, three, four, five percent of your building that had trouble, if five, 10 years later, there's one percent that's a new area or a fail on the old repair, you take a look at it easily and, and not, you know, rope access, just swing someone around or say, geez, we'd have to pipe scaffolding and everything. No, you, you really don't have to do that. You can adapt and we have, and many other people have, existing old roofs to have attachment points for swing scaffolding to get right back at these spots and make sure if you did, even with all the proper techniques, if a new spot isn't failing or if an old spot had trouble. Um, not really hard to do, but it does take some thought in the right approach. Next. This is an area where you can see the steel clip um, that anchors the limestone back. And you can see in line with windows where a lot of the spalls are, it's thinner stone there. They had to, for the, the steel frame and around the windows and all that. So it's, it's not that far from the surface. The, the stone is not as deep and the clip is not set as far back. So when that face of that rusts, it can spall the limestone and it pops it out to the face when it was too close to the, to the exterior to begin with and the mortar joints weren't maintained well. Or in this case, for example, you can see the window sealant has failed. Or if you can't see it, I can. It's, it's debonded from the window frame. That, that uh, gray caulking next to the bronze window is open. So water comes down, hits that joint at the, at the limestone, work its way over and hits that clip. One thing that's fortunate for the building, for anyone that would want to save it, is that old steel, it's not like modern steel, uh, does not rust easily. Um, so you have to have a lot of water hitting that for a lot of years before you get some surface corrosion. If that steel was from the 80s or, or newer, you, it would be gone essentially, it would just be disintegrated. So the purity of the steel, the era and so forth makes a very big difference and the longevity. So there are, there are isolated spots like this around windows and under windows where a lot of water was getting in and you get some spalls, but it doesn't mean it's everywhere. Um, next. So this will show you a picture of uh, more typical around the building. When someone does a report like we do and looks at the, shows a, the problems in a building, might show 100 photos of all the typical problems uh, and lots of photos of each type. But what you don't often see is the photos of all the good area where, the, where really nothing bad was found and it'd be pretty easy to maintain. And this is, the, this is one of the most typical photos you know, of the building shots that you don't see spalls even below windows or above windows. You don't see cracks and uh, uh, you, you wouldn't even need to set up necessarily uh, pipe scaffolding to address anything that is there. You can swing stage it, which is a lot cheaper. But you can see from the details too in the limestone, even up high, very sharp, it's not eroded in good condition. 
So it's, uh, it's, it's overall in good shape, but it does need a lot of love and it hasn't gotten that over the years. So in any adaptive reuse, you really have to make sure you have the right approach and you have a way of maintaining it that you would have to put, set up points so you can easily um, lower uh, to the edge. And this helps clean the windows and all that swing scaffolding so you can get, get uh, direct access um, and in isolated spots, fix them as you go. Because if you have, you know, 30, 40 years of, of almost nothing being done in the building uh, and then a bunch of cracks and then someone taking photos like us saying, showing all the cracks and then the assumption that, well, geez, we're going to have to strip it all, uh, which there have been many studies of this building and many of them have come to the conclusion that even recent that you wouldn't have to strip it all. Um, but it takes some real money. Uh, and I don't know, we don't, we don't get into is the state going to contribute, is the city going to contribute other historic tax credits and so forth, but it, it does take some time and money. But once you have that done, it would not be a continuing headache. There are buildings like that are made of brownstone or something else that falls apart that no matter what you do year to year, it's going to continue to disintegrate. And I, I feel bad for those um, types of buildings that are inherently just going to fall apart. This one is not one of them, though. I can say that definitively. <laughs> but we want to thank you. And this is, I want to just leave, and before we transition over uh, to Lillian Wong and, and the RISD team, this was <laughs> this is a fun photo. In 1954, I think it was, twice, lightning hit the eagles up top knocked a head off and landed in the street, almost it crushed a car. Luckily, no one was in it, you know, and long story with that. Um, scared the heck out of people where it hit and they thought a bomb was going off. But those eagles heads that used to be on the very top, after getting hit twice, they, they were cut off and you could see this one's scheduled to, to be de decapitated where those lines are. And, um, and that was uh, David Anderson's father who, who did that, made those marks, cut it, um, old mason and took down the heads so they wouldn't get struck by lightning and falling more beautiful large cedar planks which you could still see from the inside looking up to cover that that platform area and um, with and then with waterproofing and copper um i we haven't been able to locate any of the eagles heads but when they were cut off i'm sure they weren't all thrown out in someone's yard it's probably one of those but uh interesting story where where they uh, had to install lightning protection and uh, we, no, we no longer have the, the heads. Uh, a beautiful historic shot of that. Hey, Michael. Okay. Yes. Uh, there was one question that came through, and I'm not sure we're, we're positioned to answer it right now, yep. but the question uh, was, is there an understanding of the cost of deferred maintenance versus regular upkeep of this, uh, this building? Um, it, sure, although in this bill, because so much of it, yeah, yeah it's cheaper to maintain over time, a calculation, you know, coming up with a dollar amount, had you done it right over the years, which, um, you know, it's definitely cheaper because then you don't get displaced stone where you'd have to rebuild that section of wall. So if you keep a wall watertight by pointing it, uh, which might be, you know, a, a between five and 10, let's just say $10 a, a square foot. It depends on how many joints there are to, to, to do and all that. So instead of $10 or $15, you might go up to $100 because now you're, you're reworking the stone. So instead of maintaining the mortar joints and, and, um, and fixing your roof and your parapet flashings and all that, if you have to rebuild stone, it's a lot more money. Um, that said, we haven't done an analysis in this building of how much was lost monetarily of not maintaining it right. No, but um, on a building like this, that's one of the things people have to keep in mind that if, if someone comes up with a, oh my God, it's gonna cost uh, you know, 10, 20, $30 million to fix it. Well, if that were a small you know, house, a small building, that's a lot of money. If there are hundreds of thousands of square feet on the inside, and actually it's not a lot, it's deferred maintenance. You're taking all the maintenance over the years, compiling it into one budget and saying, hey, we're, 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 we might have to put 10,000, 10 million into this, sorry. But it's, and the square, you look at it as a square foot cost uh, rather than how much is it for that building? Because how many square feet are you going to lease out or occupy? And what's a reasonable cost on the exterior per square foot 
Um, and what would it cost for a new cladding per square foot? What would it class, cost if you ripped it all down per square foot? What would it cost if you could fix what's there in place and maintain it properly? And those are three totally different numbers. Um, and uh, that, that we're, ex I mean, we do that every day, provide options along with cost estimates for, for the different options. But the cheapest is to maintain it well by, by a long shot. 